So um, welcome to this session here called Lifetime Management of Patients with Severe Autic Stenosis, Securing Long-Term uh, Benefits. There will be uh, three learning objectives for this session. First is to learn about lifetime management of patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis, and also to understand uh, the importance of the heart team in actually plan for patient-specific treatment. And finally, to understand how procedural refinement may optimize long-term outcome. Um, my name is Lars Sondergaard. I'm a cardiologist based in Copenhagen. Uh, I'm moderating this session together with Darren Mylott from Galway in Ireland. We have Francesco Begdoni from uh, Milan in Italy, Leonard Conradi from Hamburg in Germany, and Wong Kim from Neu Bad Neuheim in Germany as well. So, uh, Darren, we want this session to be as interactive as possible. Yeah, so um, we're keen that, uh, that you pass us on your questions, that uh, your comments, um, you can do so either by going to the microphones or indeed if you open up your PCR app, uh, hit the interactive button on the bottom of the screen and then select Theatre Bordeaux. Um, uh, any questions that you give us or any burning issues that you have, we can address to, to the faculty and, uh, and get them answered for you. Yeah. And also this session is going to be a case-based session. We're going to to discuss a specific case and both what is the treatment option and finally we're going to see how it was actually done by, as a recorded uh, case. So Francesco, maybe you can just kick us off uh, by showing uh, the case we're going to discuss, uh, at least should be the basis for the discussion uh, this afternoon. Good morning from uh, San Donato Hospital in Milan. I'm Dr. Bedogni. I'm working with uh, Luca Testa and uh, Nedi Brambilla, and uh, we are going to present the case of TAVI implant in a low risk patient uh, with uh, accurate uh, NEO2 uh, TAVI valve. Um, this, is, uh, this is our CAT lab, and now we will present the PowerPoint presentation of the case. This is the case. These are my disclosures. It's a 70 years old man with hypertension, dyslipidemia, recent onset of dyspnea, with a current uh, NIA class between 2 and 3, and echo evidence of uh, aortic stenosis. The STS score is 1.8, so is a low risk patient, relatively young, but over 75 years old, so we decide to perform TAVI. This is the echo, uh, good ejection fraction, uh, mild mitral regurgitation, but severe aortic stenosis, mean gradient of 40 millimeters mercury, a valve area 0.7 centimeters square. This is the annulus, uh, quite circular, with uh, a mean diameter of 24.2, and the perimeter of 76.9 that uh, is compatible with uh, an accurate uh, M. Uh, there is no calcium, few calcium in, on the leaflet, and the, the ascending aorta is not uh, uh, dilated. Um, there is a, a safe coronary eight with normal origin of the, at the middle of right and left valsalva sinuses, uh, with uh, a uh, 120 degree angle between, uh, between them. Uh, the aorta is slightly horizontal and uh, there are uh, no problems for peripheral access. Let's uh, start uh, with the case. Okay, so thanks Francesco. So um, this, just to summarize, a 78 year old gentleman very little comorbidity, low surgical risk, STS score is 1.8%. So if I start to ask you, Leonard, um, as your cardiac surgeon, when accepting a patient like this for aortic valve replacement, what should be, you consider, um, what's, which factors should you consider when you decide whether to use a transcatheter or surgical aortic valve replacement? Thank you, and thank you for presenting the case, Francesco. So first of all, I think uh, we need to state that this patient has two options, right? He could be he's very anatomically and uh, I guess functionally well eligible for TAVR as well as SAVR. He's mm -hmm. not inoperable. He's so sure that he was low risk and the aortic anatomy would allow for a classical surgery. So if that was the case, then I think we should um, 
ask the patient, you know, talk to the patient, what, what, what are his preferences. If someone is 78, I think we do have, he does have a good chance of a lifetime durability with both procedures, given a good implant. And uh, last point would be that, according to the recent guidelines, it would be uh, a TAVR eligible case. So mm -hmm. I think the patient has both uh, options mm -hmm. available. So, so Leonard, maybe you can just uh, update us on the guidelines, both the American guidelines and the European guidelines. And there are some difference in, in how you select, you select the patient based on age. Yeah, I think uh, most of you are, know that uh, there is quite a bit of discussion around age thresholds, even though I keep, s keep saying that age alone is not uh, the only discriminator. It is one of many parameters to be considered. And um, where the um, European guidelines maybe stress a, 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 an exact age threshold a little more, the American guidelines give an age span. If it comes down to the individual case discussion, I don't think the differences are that obvious as they seem on the paper. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe one other thing is that the American guidelines ask for the type of valve that is being considered as the initial filter, so to speak. So mm -hmm. is it going to be a mechanical valve or is it going to be a biological valve? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, I would say in everyday decision making, we're not that far apart as it seems at first glance. Mm -hmm. Lars, if I can, there's a question online uh, from Giuseppe Martucci uh, from, uh, from Montreal, one of my mentors. Hello, Giuseppe. Um, it's for you, Francesco, does this patient have coronary disease? And if the patient did have coronary disease, how would that change your decision? Well, it depends what kind of uh, coronary disease is. Uh, it depends because it's a very diffuse disease uh, with a uh, high risk procedure for PTCA. Probably we can discuss uh, strong with the, with the surgeon about uh, about the procedure. If it's a simple uh, PCCA case, uh, we treat both uh, uh, with uh, with uh, in transcatheter okay. procedure. And, and in this particular patient, there, but there's no significant coronary disease here? No, we only, we only perform uh, the CT scan uh, even for coronary, uh, for coronary artery. If there is no disease, uh, we, 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 it's, uh, it's uh, another reason to, to, to decide. So we don't perform a routinely coronary angiography, but we, we think that uh, it's, uh, that's enough. Only if there is some doubt that we do for coronary angiography. So one, maybe, yeah, yeah, sure. one question that I have to Leonard. Um, uh, th this was an excellent answer, of course, very formalistic. But apart from it, if it was your relative, what would you do? Well, you don't have to look at any regulations. And, okay. uh, yeah. 78 so, years. Yeah, there, yeah. Of course, to that, each individual patient, there are also parameters that are not very well measurable, like mm -hmm. age or like a, a formal risk stratification. Um, we always say that you know the the, the immediate post procedural period is probably the one that hurts patients most after surgery. Um, so I, I think I would look at that very closely and discuss with the patient. I mean, this patient probably would have, according to hard endpoints, more or less equivalent outcomes with both procedures. This is a um, anatomy that. Would you could anticipate a good outcome mm -hmm. with, with TAVR, I would say. It's not overly calcified. The annulus is well within range for most devices. Uh, you showed that the axis is excellent. So I think both devices, be it a surgical or a transcatheter valve, would yield good acute outcomes. Mm -hmm. But they, that, that result will come at a, a different price, mm -hmm. right? Surgery versus the uh, quick reconvalescent uh, uh, way that a patient would recover from. And then, I mean, from my personal perspective, if you discuss this with patients, the immediate post-procedural phase is what's most on their minds. Uh, a, a, a possible or maybe even questionable advantage further down the road, many years after the procedure, according to the likelihood of valve deterioration, for example, or some, um, you know, um, um, benefit regarding pacemakers with surgery. These are very abstract things for patients, I have a feeling. Still, I would want to discuss it in all openness with them, but then I would say let the patient decide in the end if he's well informed. Yeah. So one, uh, I mean, this patient have many points to go for a transcatheter or valve replacement, also to the guideline, 78 years of age, so he's more than those 75 within the guideline. But he still have a longer life expectancy, maybe not very long, but longer than patient we used to treat. So when you see a patient like this, what kind of consideration would you do when you choose the kind of valve uh, you're going to, to use? Yeah, I, f I think our, um, our approach has changed from 10 years ago or 15 years ago when we started Tower. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, the focus was more on how can the patient survive the procedure with only one valve, with only one functional valve. And now the focus has uh, changed, of course. It's a paradigm shift. And now we are looking at what happens after the procedure in five years, ten years. Patients are getting younger. So I think it's important there are three or four major aspects. We try to keep the pacemaker rate as low as possible because pacemaker, I, I think it's a discrepant um, topic, but I think probably it is not benign. Then, of course, you have to look at durability. I think in 10 years we will see that um, there will be a difference between a different platform in terms of uh, deterioration. We will see. Uh, and of course, uh, you have to look at the options you have um, if the valve deteriorates, what um, valve in valve options and uh, coronary access. I think these are the major factors yeah. that you have to take into account. And I think from the experience we have uh, from um, uh, um, immediate valve in valve implantations that every interventionalist has faced, I think it is possible to do valve in valve at least once mm -hmm. in a patient. Yeah. So I think if we um, um, expect a durability of 5 to 10 years, mm. I think uh, life expectancy of 10 to 15 years can be covered by almost any anatomy, mm. even small anatomies. So Leonard, as a surgeon, you of course know what durability means for these. So maybe you can just um, tell us what, who are the patients uh, who are at risk for early valve failure and and how can we avoid this? Yes. So the, my task would be to talk about early valve failure and if there are ways uh, to, do, to avoid this. And as I, these are my disclosures. As I was preparing this talk, I was thinking about durability, and I found this example. This is, may seem strange to many of you and unfamiliar. This was a TAVR done in 2013, TA, first generation accurate, and look at the right, this was with an apical closure system. Quite a nice result, though, but probably nothing that we would still want to do nowadays. And, uh, as it, as it, but still, this patient, almost eight years later, had a beautiful transthoracic echo with no leak and no gradient. So, of course, these single examples don't mean anything, right? This is like the occasional perfect vein graft that you guys see in the cath lab. It doesn't mean anything for the whole. Uh, so, so what is, when we talk about durability, what is it? Um, I think now at least we have a notion what durability means because if we look back, and I have to say this even as a surgeon, durability does not mean freedom from reintervention. Freedom from reoperation is um, an endpoint that is unfortunately present in many uh, s surgical uh, papers, but it doesn't mean much, you know, because patients still could have a bad valve even though they have never received uh, a redo. Anyhow, I think we do know very well now with this uh, excellent paper what structural valve deterioration as opposed to durability means. It has different components, as most of you will know. It has structural components, such as wear and tear mechanisms, or non-structural, such as paravalvular leakage, for example. There's a thrombotic um, a part of it, to, or, and of course endocarditis. So I think knowing what the absence of durability is is one important step towards assessing it. And then the question for this talk was, can we optimize it? Are there things that we can influence at all? Or is it just, um, you know, uh, 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 um, uh, is it luck or, or, or uh, bad luck, whether your valve will, will, will work or not? But I don't think so. There are, of course, patient-related factors, little surprisingly, such as hypertension, hyperlipidemia. This reminds us of many areas of cardiovascular medicine where uh, the concomitant medical treatment of the, of the conditions of the patients will uh, serve the patient well and will and may even enhance durability uh, when it comes to TAVR. And then there are prosthesis-related ones, and I guess we'll discuss as we progress with this uh, symposium. So the concomitant treatment of patient-related risk factors, such as hyperlipidemia, for example, or hypertension is important, and also anticoagulation, if you think about the uh, thrombotic part of what we define nowadays as structural valve deterioration. And then prosthesis-related factors. Of course, like Vaughn has just said, the times where uh, TAVR had to be safe, saying patient survives is your, you know, your uh, aim, that's not anymore the case. We want optimal THB function. And you can influence it, of course, by implant technique. We want high implants, optimal T uh, THB function, no pacemaker. But you would also want optimal valve expansion for optimal leaflet um, uh, coaptation and mobility 
with, without you know, adverse uh, uh, features in, with this regard. And maybe most importantly, you would want a low final gradient across your valve implant and at all costs avoid patient prosthesis mismatch. And this is not trivial because in the literature, you know, there, there is a substantial portion of patients receiving expandable valve substitutes like TAVR that do have uh, the form, fulfill the formal criteria of uh, moderate or even severe uh, patient prosthesis mismatch. And we also know that a residual mean gradient above a certain level, as well as severe PPM, does influence uh, the durability of our valve and can induce structural valve deterioration. The choice of the valve type is also something that we believe has an influence, and I think with the accurate, we're well in range with other self-expandable supraannular valve types when it comes to the incidence of uh, severe pacemaker, uh, patient disease mismatch such as this bar graph. Um, we don't really have solid long-term data, as at least for this, uh, for this and for many other platforms. This is five-year outcomes, but re be reminded this is non-paired comparisons. So this is survivors with good valves. You know, let us not be misled by these beautiful graphs. The, again, you need the whole sample to make a, a good conclusion from this. So uh, I think we should be cautious in interpreting this, these results. Thank you very much. Leonard, as you make your way over, I might ask you a question. Um, uh, the data that you showed in respect to 12% um, uh, risk of patient prosthesis mismatch in the TVT registry, um, th that to my understanding was related to balloon expandable systems rather than self-expandable systems, certainly those with superannular leaflets. Does, does THV choice matter in terms of uh, patient prosthesis mismatch in, in your experience? I, th I think so. That, that, that next slide that I showed with the bar graph was our own analysis. This was a subset of patients with small annuli. So small annular dimensions are probably most prone for patients to develop patient prosthesis mismatch. We know that from the surgical literature for a long time. And uh, there is a notion that the, the type of valve or the valve concept, if you want to call it that, does have an influence, even though I do think that we don't know the complete picture yet because um, you know, the, the simple discrimination between supraannular and intraannular may not be the whole picture. There may be discrete differences, even, say, within intraannular and even within supraannular valves that we have not fully uncovered as of yet, I think. Um, one came a question for you. Um, one thing I, I, I struggle with sometimes is that um, when you see that the transcatheter heart valve, as in the case that Leonard showed us, is not completely expanded, even if you don't have PVL or a gradient, is that something that you will post-dilate routinely? Uh, or does it really depend on the age of the patient? I tend to, to leave it alone in older patients, but in younger patients, try and optimize the frame. Yeah, uh, very good question. Um, I think it really depends on the patient. It um, uh, depends on how, how you assess the risk of annular rupture, which can, ha which can happen after post-dilatation, especially in elderly fray patients. But in general, if I have a young patient and I want to have a sustainable result, I, I'm very generous uh, to postulate because uh, um, there's a lot of data out there showing that postulation reduces prosthesis mismatch. And if you have a young patient, even though there is no um, a PVL, then I, I'm very generous. Of course, we will know in 10 years or 15 years whether there is a counter impact of having uh, um, the trauma on the leaflets. But uh, in terms of having better gradients, at least, um, yeah, this, um, yes. So, I mean, uh, I think that was a very good discussion. This is certainly something um, we should take into consideration treating patients with longer life expectancy. Make sure that the patient have a valve with good hemodynamic performance, low risk of patient prestige mismatch, and, and the choice of valve can certainly make a difference. Another issue for these patients with longer life expectancy is that we need to be able to access the coronary arteries later on. We, we cannot have a situation where a patient will come back a few years later with acute coronary syndrome and you cannot cannulate the coronary arteries. So maybe one, you, you can just explain uh, what is the need for coronary access after a thyroid procedure and whether it's actually feasible in these patients uh, who had undergo thyroid in the past. Yeah, thank you, Lars, um, for the introduction. What is the need, and is it possible? And um, I can say, that, yes, there is a need. What, what did you expect? <laughs> and is it possible? Yes, it is possible in uh, most cases. And here's see a sli uh, slide explaining why there is uh, more attention on this uh, topic. Of course, there is a high 
prevalence of coronary artery disease among patients undergoing TAVI. Procedures are getting safer, so I, uh, we discussed already there's a shift of focus uh, from um, having a safe procedure to optimal outcome with uh, long-term um, aspects. Patients are getting younger longer life expectancy. And I think another uh, um, aspect is that we have, at least in our center, become very conservative re regarding PCI. Not every uh, um, distal lesion has to be treated because uh, most patients will, uh, will um, be hemodynamically stable. There are several obstacles to coronary access, uh, as nicely shown here. There are some anatomical factors that could um, contribute uh, as an um, uh, obstacle and uh, what we can um, uh, um, influence actually is the device um, selection and some procedural aspects uh, um, and this includes what um, Leonard mentioned um, implantation height and the way we rotate the uh, valve um, ac according to the um, commercial alignment and, um, and uh, again, the implantation depth. So these are factors that uh, really do play a role and um, yeah, maybe we can discuss later on. So regarding coronary access data, it's not that bad, as I told you. Um, I can, you, you could say, depending on the um, device that has been tested, overall coronary angiography, so diagnostic angiography, is usually highly successful. But we can discuss uh, what, what is high. Look, uh, when you look at these numbers here, 60%, uh, 20%, uh, here we have something in the 90%, 80%. So if, if we uh, think of coronary axis in the native anatomy, uh, at least in my experience, is 99.9%. .9%. So the question is, is 80%, which is really high, 90%, is this really acceptable? And uh, we have to take into account that um, many of these um, uh, um, uh, coronary angiograms might have been um, unselective. So in the reaxis study, uh, it, it has been nicely shown that there are some um, predictors uh, uh, to um, uh, predict uh, coronary axis uh, cannulation, which are um, anatomical, so the sinus of uh, Vassava relation to the transaortic uh, uh, transcatheter valve. The implantation depth plays a role and um, the uh, use of the Evolute, which uh, may be quite obvious. So in, um, there were 23 cases of unsuccessful cannulation and 22 of them were, were with the Evolute. Um, I, I think that it's important to highlight the difference between um, an elective setting of coronary, diagnostic coronary angiogram and um, um, acute coronary syndrome. Um, there is much more pressure and coronary, acute coronary syndrome following TAVR is around 5% overall. And if you uh, look at the data, um, there, there is uh, quite a substantial number of um, attempts to, um, um, to engage the coronary arteries, and in 8% it's unsuccessful. So what we have to keep in mind that the requirement for diagnostic um, uh, catheterization and PCI may differ in uh, terms of uh, backup, for instance, as you can see here. Thank you very much. So we saw that um, it certainly makes a difference which kind of uh, platform you use. So you, you mentioned that for the Evolut platform in the reaccess, it was almost 20% of the patient where it was not possible to, to cannulate uh, the coronary arteries. Yeah. yeah. And, um, I don't think it's important whether it's 20% or 40%. I think everything that's below 95%, it's, uh, it's a concern. Mm, it is. And you cannot compare these studies because it was a small retrospective analysis. No. But we, we have to really, f uh, the, the level must be, uh, the standard must be 99.9%, mm. yeah. which is uh, the usual uh, success rate in native anatomies. And uh, even though you might be successful, I think uh, what we don't have, we, we still need data on how long does it take. Mm. Yeah? Yeah. We are talking about door to balloon time. Mm. Nobody has measured it. Mm. And uh, you might take uh, 60 minutes for a, a primary PCI, which is okay, mm. but you don't know about the impact on outcome. No. 
So, so certainly it, it seems that uh, the type of valve you're choosing is going to affect how easy it is. But there's also something about implantation technique there, and which has been uh, evolved during the last couple of years. So maybe you can just enlighten us on that. Thanks, Lars. So um, securing access after, uh, after TAVI is, is important, and I thought that I would, in a very simplistic way, superimpose our three most commonly used systems uh, on the same anatomy. Uh, and as you can see, um, putting something in the way of, of coronary access can, of course, um, slow you down or impede you altogether. It is important to notice the difference between the Evolute platform in the middle uh, and the Neo Acker 2 on the right-hand side of your screen, whereby one has a cage and the other essentially has three open arches. It's also important to consider, well, uh, you know, we, are, we have this idea that, that short-frame valves are, are always better, but if you consider, uh, if you implant a, uh, a prosthesis at its, uh, at its intended level, in fact, you probably have, have more of a cage in the way when you use a sapien 3 at nominal height uh, compared to, uh, to the cage that you have when you implant an accurate neo. So accurate neo gives us an opportunity to, to not cover the coronaries at all, which is, uh, which is uh, by default a good idea. If, however, you are going to cover the coronaries, or if you're, going to, uh, uh, if you're not sure that you're going to cover the coronaries, you want to make sure that you have good access uh, and commissural alignment, individualized commissural alignment on a patient-by-patient -patient basis is absolutely the way to do that. By implanting or, or by using the cusp overlap technique, we can uh, essentially isolate the cusp, uh, um, the, uh, uh, the commissure, uh, between the right and the left coronary artery on the right-hand side of our cath lab screen. And if we do this, then we, we maintain perfect commissural alignment and access to the coronaries in, in all patients. Um, uh, to, to achieve this, you need to know uh, essentially the construction of the valve. Um, so the accurate NEO2 has posts and it has a free cell and when this valve is, uh, is implanted into its, uh, into its delivery capsule, this is what it looks like. You have the posts on the top and, which look like corn on the cob uh, and you have the free cell that gives you these small wings on the side of the device. What's most important is to understand um, the location of, of these small posts and you see these little um, uh, orange bars that come up. Uh, and these are what help us orientate the accurate NEO to ensure that we get individualized patient commissural alignment. And essentially, we can do this in three very simple steps. And we saw data presented today from Karolinska in 170 patients that this is absolutely reproducible, um, and it takes about 40 seconds with no issues in terms of strokes or any adverse outcomes. And so what we do is simply, for step one, insert the valve uh, into the body with the, uh, with the, uh, the safety port uh, at 6 o'clock rather than 12 o'clock. So we can all do that. It's very simple. Step two, insert the valve uh, into the, uh, the patient annulus, usually at the top of the pigtail. And when we get to that uh, three-cusp view, assess where are those posts that we spoke about. On this particular patient, you see two posts here uh, on the outside. And when you have two posts on the outside, if you rotate clockwise, so two outer clock, two o'clock, that will allow you to get perfect commissural alignment very quickly. If, on the other hand, you have two posts on the inner aspect of the aorta, you'd simply counter counterclock or anti-clock. So then step three, you go to the two-cusp view. You rotate either clockwise or counterclockwise according to what you saw uh, in your three-cusp view. You ensure that you have a single post uh, on the right-hand side of your screen. You ensure that you have that small wing on the right-hand side of your screen. And at that point, 40 seconds later, you can forget about commissural alignment. It's already done. Go back and implant your valve in normal three-cusp view. To give you an example, three-cusp view. Uh, this is a patient we did a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we go to the two-cusp view, and we've rotated at this point uh, clockwise because we had two on the outer curve. We then go ahead and implant the valve, and already in this three-cusp view, you can see that the three commissural posts are, are, are split evenly right across uh, um, the, uh, the screen, and we can go and check in that two-cusp view uh, to ensure uh, that we have isolated that single commissure on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, uh, Wang Kim, you, you asked the question about we need to measure how long does it take, and Francesco, I took this from you. Let's see how long it takes to cannulate a, a left main after implantation of an accurate neo. I think that's about two to three seconds. So with that, Lars, I'll stop, and yeah. uh, we can take any questions, of course. So 
Francesco is a commercial alignment now, uh, routinely daily practice, and this is something you can do with all kind of transcaffeine heart valves. Yes, we try to do that thing with uh, any kind. Sure, um, now with accurate neo, it's very easy to achieve a good uh, commissure alignment. Uh, a little bit more difficult with other valves. It's uh, quite uh, easy with the Medtronic valve. It's quite difficult with the Abbott valve. It's uh, quite impossible mm -hmm. to achieve it with the Edwards valve. So sure, yeah. uh, I think that uh, this uh, this device is very it's, it's, uh, sure the most simple. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, device to achieve a correct yeah. commissure alignment. So again, uh, even though uh, coronary access after TAVI is a major issue, I think if you if you choose your valve for a specific patient and you use this technique, uh, I think in most patients you will be able to access the coronary arteries in the future. Lena, we were just talking about the durability before. Do you think a commercial alignment will also impact the durability? I mean, will it give a better durability of these valves than if you have a misalignment? Yeah, it's funny that you should ask that because this was what I was thinking of, and I didn't say it, but maybe you remember that that TA valve was also commercially aligned because we just did it that way. Mm. You know, not only this one, but also the other ones which, which by you know, design intent needed to be implanted correct to the, the engager or the Jenna valve. We would never really... Th talked much about uh, coronary engagement in these cases as a primary reason. It was more the uh, theoretical assumption that the valve stent and leaflet dynamics would be more favorable if, if they were aligned commissure to commissure. Mm. Um, now, I have to say, even back then, we were thinking this is a very theoretical assumption, but think about the, the, the uh, situation we were all in back then. You know, this was to implant a valve which should function reasonably well and not hurt the patient while doing so. So mm -hmm. these uh, theoretical assumptions came prior, as secondary or maybe ter tertiary assumptions. I think there, there could be many theoretical advantages of doing this. I think no one's ever proven it, really. No. Yeah. Um, one of the other issues that, that you mentioned in your talk in terms of uh, ensuring durability and one Kim mentioned in terms of ensuring a good outcome for the patient is, is avoidance of other issues such as uh, other complications such as permanent pacemaker. So Lars, you might tell us about uh, the, the, the issue with, uh, with conduction. Does yeah. it still have an impact uh, in 2022 and how do we avoid pacemakers? Yeah, I think we just touched on two very important issues when we treat patients with longer life expectancy, durability of these valves, access to the coronary arteries, but of course also conduction abnormality can be a major issue for these patients. We used to say in the beginning of the TAVI program that if the patient would receive a new permanent pacemaker, it would be a benign complication. It would not affect the outcome for the patient, but I think we have now seen robust data that that's certainly not the case. Even patients who got a new left bundle branch block after the procedure seems to have a worse outcome. You've seen this meta-analysis with more than 40,000 patients. If you got new onset left bundle branch block, you have a high risk of all-cause mortality, cardiac mortality, hospitalization for heart failure, and also subsequently a risk for new permanent pacemaker. And we know that the issue is that there's a very close proximity between the aortic annulus and the conduction system. It's actually only separated by the membrane septum, which in some of these patients can actually be seen by on the pre-procedural CT scan. So what we need in a given patient, what we can influence, because there will be some patient-specific factors where we have no control, but we can use uh, valves which have a less of risk of conduction abnormality. We know that if a stent frame is tapered, if you have a deep implantation, or if you manipulate too much in the left ventricular alpha tract, the risk of new onset conduction abnormality is much higher. So how does uh, the accurate valve uh, perform? These are data from the two randomized trials, the SCOPE 1 and the SCOPE 2. SCOPE 1 randomized patients to accurate new or Sapien 3. And you can see here, despite we say that the Sapien valve is the valve which have the lowest risk of conduction abnormality or new permanent pacemaker, it was actually exactly the same outcome with an accurate new. And the scope two, randomizing patients between the accurate valve and the Evolut platform, there was almost a 50% reduction in the risk of permanent pacemaker using the accurate valve. So certainly, this is one way you can try to minimize the risk of new onset conduction abnormality and need for permanent pacemaker is to choose the right platform. There's also been a change in the implantation technique. All of us started out in a cl classical tree cusp co-planner view, taking all the tilt off the aortic analysis of the 
tree cusp was aligned with the imaging plane, but that also means in most of the cases we will have a severe parallax on your delivery system. And if you change that on your C, I'm still working in an LAO projection taking the parallax out, you're just going to introduce a similar tilt in the aortic annulus, meaning that you have a suboptimal understanding how deep or how high are you with your implant during the valve deployment. So that's why it's now been suggested to use this cusp overlap view. This is on the S-curve where the right and the left cusp are overlapping. And you can see that will bring your C-arm from a LAO cranial projection towards an REO caudal projection. And just to see here, to summarize what, what it actually means, you see this is a cranial, caudal, it's an LAO REO projection, so normally we used to work here, and there's a quite long distance between the curve from the tree cusp and the delivery system. So once again, if you take the parallax out, we're going to introduce quite a lot of tilt in the, uh, in the aortic uh, annulus. Whereas if you're going to move to the cusp of view, we're going to get very close to where these two S-curves are crossing, so where the tree aortic cusp are aligned with the imaging plane, and we have no parallax in the delivery system. And the distance, even though we are not perfect in the double S-curve crossing be very close, and the distance between those two curves are very small. So these are the two options, or the two possibilities. You have to minimize the risk of new permanent pacemaker after TAVI, choose the right platform, and also use the cost overlap technique. Thanks, Lars. Uh, a quick question as, as you come over. Um, the cusp overlap technique we've developed in the last number of years, and we've seen that, um, that this, this gives us a way to implant the valve higher if, if we so choose to do so. Um, are we looking to implant the accurate NEO device higher, or are we looking to implant it at, at the appropriate implant depth? What, what does cusp overlap do? Because we've seen other platforms have, have intentionally implanted the valve higher, and that can cause issues in terms of coronary access and so forth. Yeah, but we're actually not aiming for high implantation. So when you look at your fluorous screen, it's the same target we're aiming for. But when we are working in a cusp overlap view, we got the true understanding how deep we are. So it's nothing about trying to implant it a millimeter or two higher. We still have the same target, and thereby you will end up in a higher projection. When you're working in a tra traditional LAO cranial projection, you're going to get full because there will be parallax in your system or in the aortic valve. So you think you are higher than you actually are. So you're still implanting at the nominal depth. Yeah. depth. You're just very sure that that nominal depth is, is where you are. Exactly. So Francesco, um, uh, you have multiple systems available to you. Tell us, uh, finally, sum this up for us. What, why, this, why did you choose a Boston Scientific Accurate Neo 2 for this, uh, for this patient, apart from the fact that this is a sponsored session by Boston Scientific? This is a patient with a good, uh, a good um, femoral access, so no problem uh, for uh, accurate two. Is a, is a patient with uh, well to avoid uh, pacemaker because the, the rate of pacemaker is, uh, is uh, and it's very easy to find the correct uh, alignment uh, with the with the coronary um, correct co commissural alignment. So I think there's uh, many reason to choose uh, accurate team. Huh? And. Uh, Let's see the case. Uh, important aspect to, to reduce uh, peripheral complication that might have an impact on patient prognosis uh, is uh, um, the echo guided puncture of the vessel. We start with the venous uh, femoral uh, access and uh, for the PM, and then we, we make uh, the puncture of the arterial contralateral access for injection and uh, crossover femoral protection. Then we, we check the puncture side. You can see the echo of the, the 018 wire in a femoral artery, and we puncture uh, then uh, under echo uh, guidance the uh, main uh, femoral access. Okay. After the uh, preclosure preparation with a two proglide, we insert through a stiff wire this very performant uh, eye sleeve uh, expandable sheet to complete all the femoral work. We follow the sheet inside the act. So, perfect. Uh, now, uh, due to reduce uh, the, the, uh, the um, risk of embolization, we decide to place uh, a uh, cerebral protection uh, with the sentinel device. This is a, an, uh, uh, 
and uh, 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 bovine arch that sometimes is considered a contraindication, but it's not a contraindication. It needs only a little bit more uh, uh, work to achieve uh, a correct position of the basket. This is uh, the, uh, the, the implant of uh, the, the distal uh, basket in left uh, carotid artery, and this is uh, the uh, proximal basket uh, at uh, uh, the origin of the innominate trunk. So uh, in this way, we uh, try to give the uh, protection to the uh, cerebral circulation. Then uh, we have the, the uh, injection in three cast view before to uh, enter in a ventricle with a non plus catheter, a, a straight wire to cross the aortic stenosis. After that, uh, we insert a long uh, J-tip uh, wire because we prefer to place uh, in uh, best position our uh, stiff wire for the TAVI implant. Uh, you will see we go with uh, a pigtail. Pigtail is important to place it to the apex, uh, the catheter and uh, to measure the pressure because it's very important to measure the pressure before the implant. Then uh, we proceed uh, with uh, the valvuloplasty uh, with a 20 millimeter balloon as a predilatation. It's uh, something that uh, we usually do with uh, with the accurate new to valve uh, to help uh, the deployment uh, of the of the valve. In lifetime management of this uh, relatively young patient, it's very important to keep a free access to the coronary vessel for coronary procedure or for future TAVI and TAVI. Therefore, it's important to achieve a correct commissural alignment to avoid the new commissure in front of the coronary ostia. Um, with the accurate NEO2, we can easily achieve this uh, uh, result, placing three separate tabs in the three cusp uh, view and two tabs superimposed on the left and one tab on the right in the small curve of the aorta in a cusp overlap view. So we to, uh, to, to try to have a correct commissural alignment we have to start uh, with, uh, with uh, the uh, flash port uh, at uh, uh, six hour in uh, the watch so we advance uh, uh, in this, uh, uh, we start in this uh, position, we advance uh, the, the valve uh, through the sheet and uh, we cross uh, without uh, uh, rotation <coughs> through the uh, aortic arch. Then we stop in the ascending aorta and we check uh, the commissural line. And you will see very well this three tab in this uh, position. We have one on the right and two on the left. It's not a perfect correctly position. We, this is uh, the uh, three cast projection. So we have to rotate in counterclockwise uh, direction very slowly, you will see the flash port now is, is a 12 hour, and to try to obtain one, one, one uh, tab in, uh, in uh, three cast view. Then very slowly, we have to, to rotate very slowly to obtain uh, this uh, position, then uh, now is absolutely better. We check in, in uh, we check again, and then we check in cusp uh, overlap view. We have the two tabs on the left and one on the right, and uh, so the direction is good. After that, we can enter in a, in a, with the, with the valve in the native. Uh, aortic valve, and we check again our position in three cast view, and uh, and we leave uh, 
the tension and uh, we accept the rotation. You, now you can see that the flash process that, that our tree and uh, we check again in both uh, projection and you can see in three cast uh, in cast overlap view there is two tabs on the right, uh, left uh, and one on the right. At that point uh, we are happy about our uh, position and uh, the rotation of uh, our valve can, and we can start open the proximal part of the valve. We check the eight. It's very important that the pigtail stay in the non-coronary sinus, so in a non-coronary sinus because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, our reference point. And then if we are okay, we can we can check the final position and uh, deliver it quickly, the, the valve. You will see Nady will turn very quickly and uh, to deploy the valve. Now we check the pressure, it's okay. We carefully retrieve our delivery system, system trying to don't, uh, touch our valve. Rosalia is happy about uh, the result because the pressure are absolutely okay. And uh, this is uh, this is the injection, no regurgitation with the pigtail inside. And uh, you can see the now the coronary injection is very easy to enter in the coronary. The the cast uh, the commissural alignment is uh, is perfect. You will see. We, it is very easy to enter in the in the, in a coronary uh, artery, and, uh, and this means that if we need to treat this artery, it's very easy. Then we retrieve the cerebral protection device. First, uh, we retrieve the distal one, and then the proximal one. One without problem, even if uh, we are the, uh, in. Uh, in a bovine arch. Then, uh, to, to reduce the risk of peripheral complication, we, we inflate a, a balloon in crossover and uh, we remove uh, the, uh, the, the sheath with uh, two proglides and uh, uh, without, uh, without problem. Okay, for the first one that we implanted, the second one. At the end, of the, we check the filter. Uh, there is some debris, as usual, and it's better to add it in, a, in the filter uh, than in the brain. Thank you for your attention. That was a beautiful demonstration, Francesco, here. And uh, I think also you, you showed how Easy it is to use this valve. I mean, it's 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 even though it's a self-expanding technology, it's like a balloon expandable deployment. It's 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 very fast to do it and very predictable. And also, I think uh, you also demonstrated how little manipulation you actually have in the left ventricular alpha tract, which may also be one of the reasons that uh, you have a, such a low rate of pacemaker with this valve. Um, one one thing we haven't discussed, we have discussed about durability, coronary access. Um, Conduction abnormality, which is particularly important if you treat these patients with longer life expectancy. What about pyvalvular leak uh, with this this valve? Yeah, this is a very important question, uh, and I mean we know there is no perfect valve out here, and um, I think uh, the Equid Neo is one of the most balanced valves in terms of pacemaker or the aspect that we discussed. But we know, uh, and we had to um, acknowledge that there was some problem, uh, some issue with PVL. We have seen in scope one and scope two, there were different um, reasons behind this. But uh, there was a problem, and we have to uh, recall that the Accurate Neo, the first generation, uh, was used since 2012 without any sealing um, technology. And uh, with the Neo 2, I think. So this maybe has you can just, just, just explain what's, what's the difference between the Neo and the Neo 2 valve? There's no big difference. The, um, the only difference is the marker. There's a radio pack marker, and uh, the um, Neo 2, for the first time, has an active sealing technology. And I think we have um, um, data out there uh, increasing 
amount of uh, evidence that there is a difference in terms of PV leak reduction. Of course, the radio force is the same, but I think Boston is working also on this and also on, on expansion of um, annular range that can be treated. So uh, I, I think overall, um, probably um, also more challenging um, calcified anatomies could be addressed with this um, uh, um, um, uh, technique now with this um, system. Of course, not those very extremely calcified, but I think in very extremely calcified, I, I would still um, opt for surgical mm -hmm. options. I don't know. So, so just just one final question on this PVL. Where are we now with the accurate new valve with regard to PVL compared to other valves in the market? So we have data comparing, for instance, the Ultra with the um, Neo, of course, in the selected population, and uh, propensity matched is similar with around 1%. We will present the data tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And we have registry data from um, several European centers. We are around 2%, coming from 5% with the accurate Neo 1. So mm -hmm. there is a considerable reduction of uh, PVL. Of course, it's not zero, but um, no. uh, we also have a major reduction in mild PVL, mm -hmm. uh, so, which so might the, play a role. So this certain. active sealing skirt seems to make a big difference with the guards? It, it works. Yeah. It mm -hmm. definitely works. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a question online, Francesco, maybe I might address to you, um, is, is that I suppose with all uh, valves where we don't have an option to recapture, such as balloon expandable technology or indeed the accurate NEO, um, what, what, how do we address patients if the valve slides into the ventricle or, or, or pops up? What, what are your, your, your treatment options in that pretty rare scenario? Well, it's, uh, it's a very important it's a valve to, to when, uh, when you have the pop out to, to try to fix the valve in a, in a safe position. In a, so in, in, this, uh, in this situation, well, sometimes we, we, we try to, uh, to, to, to snare the valve or to create the circuit to, to remove the wire. And then uh, you, f you fix, when you fix the, 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 the valve, then uh, you can cross with any other kind of valve, even with, uh, again, with accurate NEO2. Okay, so, so getting the valve up uh, uh, away from the coronary yeah. arteries if it's popped out yes, or popped down is, is a, the way to do it. This is mandatory, I think. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or potentially fixing it if it's slid into the ventricle, but still within the annulus, fixing it with maybe a balloon expandable system yeah. might, might be an option. Yeah. Um, Leonard, can I, can I ask you, in terms of... Um, the option of revalving um, uh, a valve. I mean, that, that's, that's really the future, perhaps not for this 78-year-old patient, but certainly moving into younger patients. Many of the advantages of accurate uh, low pacemaker rate, now low PVL, good coronary access, um, uh, they're features that, that, that are very important. But in due course, we're going to have failures of, 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 of accurate NEO in the same way as we're going to have failures of, of Medtronic's valve and Edwards' valve. Is there an option to, to revalve an accurate NEO, or do you know what, what treatment options are should, should we get structural valve deterioration? No, I, I think there, there definitely are, and I, th I think the whole discussion is moving towards that field. I mean, it's not for nothing that we're calling this issue lifetime management and not, not exclusively durability, because there is a difference between the two, right? Lifetime management is an active phrase, so you're obviously managing something later down the road. So it's not like we're staring at uh, incoming longer-term data exclusively, but we're also looking at, like you say, the option of revalving. Um, I think we don't know everything about it yet. I think there are some things that we would all, you know, sign off on directly, uh, that uh, many scenarios with intraannular deteriorated valves may be easy um, targets, but I think as of more lately, as we start to discuss commercial alignment, for example, implant height and so forth, um, also superannular valves can be uh, treated with, uh, with another device later down the road. Now, wh which would be the next uh, optimal substrate for that. I think there's very limited data on that. There's, it's heavily influenced by personal preference, I would say. Uh, remember the early accurate days where they were discouraging using a balloon expandable intraannular valves to do this, should it be necessary? I don't think that's a valid for all patients. I'm, I'm certain, I'm, I'm absolutely positive that there are patients that could be uh, treated with a balloon expandable valve. I guess it all depends on your follow-up CT once that event has occurred. 
uh, to assess the exact valve position in relation, spatial relation to the coronaries, to the sinus walls, to the annulus. And uh, so it is a complex decision, but I don't think it can be generally answered. Okay, so, so patient-specific, understanding the individual's patient's anatomy, but, but it seems like we are seeing some emerging data that this may be a valve that has specific features that allow us to revalve in due yes. course with a, with a balloon expandable valve. Um, one, Kim, can I just another question to you uh, regarding coronary artery disease? Um, uh, there is a specific question regarding if someone has significant coronary disease, what is your, your, your favorite option? Treating it before the TAVI, treating it during, treating it after, or indeed not treating it at all? What, where, what are you doing with coronary artery disease in your center? Um, very good question. It depends on the... Um, um uh, relevance of, of it. If it's a proximal LAD or main stem, then probably it should be addressed for prognostic reasons. But most of the patients that um, um, come for ta TAVI workup wouldn't have been, uh, the coronary artery disease wouldn't have detected otherwise, you have to say. So uh, it's a really uh, important question which is being addressed in several trials, so P um, TAVI, PCI, and, and, and so on. Uh, as a rule of thumb, I, I think um, most TAVI cases can be done safely despite rap rapid pacing, despite um, um, blood pressure drop, etc., uh, even with relevant coronary artery disease. This is my personal opinion. And sometimes it's really probably safer to uh, quickly insert a um, um, TAVI valve than to make a, a very... Um, uh, complex uh, left main um, intervention, which can take one, one or two hours. And uh, the decision is also driven by the fact that um, the recommendation for dual uh, antiplatelet inhibition has changed recently. So for TAVI itself, you don't need uh, additional um, uh, clopidogrel or anything. Uh, so you, you don't need duct uh, and, and re only require single uh, antiplatelet inhibition, which might um, affect uh, bleeding rates. So if it's not relevant, then I think uh, also depending on the valve platform you use, it's probably sa safe to defer uh, afterwards and to see what happens if it's not really a, a relevant um, osteal yeah. LED or something. So, so perfectly reasonable in 2022 to defer and see how the patient does, especially when you can get commissural mm -hmm. alignment and, and be confident of, of reaccess. Exactly, yeah, depending on the um, platform. Two, two quick questions. One is from Alexandre Karma um, that I might send on to you, Francesco. I think it relates to severe calcium. Do you prefer uh, in severe calcified cases balloon expandable or, or self-expandable prosthesis? What is your, your gut feeling? So uh, it depends, but uh, uh, obviously if uh, there is um, uh, an, uh, um, some uh, val uh, highly calcified valve uh, where the, the risk of the, of the annulus rupture is, uh, especially if there is uh, calcium in, uh, in uh, LVOT, the risk of uh, annulus rupture with balloon expandable valve equal tire. So in this case, I prefer uh, use uh, self-expanding valve, uh, probably with, uh, with the new valve, with, uh, with the ceiling cuff, probably might be uh, more effective and uh, more safe. Thank you. Um, two, two other questions online. Um, uh, Lars, one is a quick one from Marcelo Ravani. Um, do you pace during the implant of the accurate NEO? Uh, and a follow-up one, um, uh, is there a specific technique required for chimney stenting with the accurate NEO should you choose to do that technique? Yeah, first of all, I mean, uh, we all paced in the beginning when we did step number two, it opened the inflow part. I think everyone has stopped that now. It's not, it's not needed. Uh, it, it will be stable. It will expand very fast, so there's no reason to pace. Chimney standing, of course, you can do chimney standing in the same way as for other valves if you have a risk or a fear that you're going to occlude one of the uh, coronary ostium while implanting the valve. I will say the risk of coronary occlusion is lower with this valve due to the design. You have this upper crown actually pushing uh, the leaflets away from the coronary ostium. But of course, it can be done in the same way. Just uh, start your long stent in the ostium of, of the coronary artery at risk and, and take it up to the sinus of Asalva. So I think we, we're approaching the end of this uh, session. Uh, I, the purpose was to discuss uh, when we're moving to a patient with longer life expectancy, there are certain 
number of issues we need to consider, which is not present when we treat patients with a very limited life expectancy. We have talked about valve durability, choose a valve which have a good durability, good hemodynamic performance, and low rate of patient prestige mismatch, and also choose a valve where, when it eventually will fail, if the patient li live long enough, have a chance to do a valve and valve procedure, a type in type of procedure. Also talking about what about coronary access, it's really important to be able to access the coronary arteries in these patients with longer life expectancy. Large stem cells, commercial alignment, it seems to solve this uh, issue for most of the patient. Conduction abnormality can also have impact the clinical outcome. So again, choose a valve which have a low rate of conduction abnormality. And then finally, paravalvular leak should be a low risk. So these new generation valve with an external senior skirt seems to almost 100% have solved this problem. So I hope this was useful for you, to you. Uh, and thanks all for you for attending the session. And thanks to the panel here. And also for, to the chat master, Ahmed El Gwindi, who uh, passed all these questions uh, to us. So have a nice evening. See you tomorrow.